Welcome to The Sword and the Trowel, a podcast of Founders Ministries. <laughs> Founders Ministries exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of churches. I'm Jared Longshore. And I'm Tom Askell. Hey, thanks for being here with us today. To uh, all those folks who tune into The Sword and the Trowel, we are very thankful to you. Yes, you know, it's like four or five people I know for sure that listen to us. I know, man. Hey. We Thank appreciate you. those yeah. folks. We appreciate those folks. And those who are Founders Alliance members, we extend a very special thank you to you, those who are fighting with us, supporting us. If you want to know more about what it means to be a Founders Alliance member, go to founders.org, click on the Give page. We are going to resource you with all kinds of good content. How are those pastoral epistles with Pastor Tom coming? Well, I love the pastoral epistles, and I put up with Pastor Tom. Good. So, so Pastor Tom's teaching through uh, the Apostle Paul's pastoral epistles. And uh, that content is available to our Founders Alliance members. Check out what it means to join us in the fight. Hey, we're going to be at the uh, Southern Baptist Convention. That's right, in just a few days. Just a few days away. Birmingham. This is exciting stuff, Birmingham, where all the bridges on the interstates are under construction, I've been told. So we will have fun traveling. You know, I've never seen a Baptist be held back from getting to that convention. I think we're going to just overcome every obstacle. The problem is, see, I'm all about building bridges, and there they are blowing them up in Birmingham. You are a bridge builder. You are a bridge builder. (laughs) We're going to have an event there on Monday. Monday, before the SBC. Before the SBC, day before the convention. Come out and join us. Mature manhood and an immature age. You're going to be speaking at this. Owen Strand's going to be speaking at this from Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Mark Coppinger is going to be speaking at this from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Tom Nettles, uh, all sorts of people. And David, David Miller, Miller is going to be speaking country at this. preacher at large. It's going to be great. And then you have a debate. How are you preparing for your debate? <clears throat> How am I preparing for my debate? Well, I tell you what I've been doing. Oh, I've been running no. the steps of the You've village. been chasing chickens? <laughs> You've been drinking raw eggs? Bow, bow, oh, yeah, man. I've been lifting weights. You've been doing lifting it. Lifting weights. You're going to be get debating a- Dwight, McKissick Dwight McKissick on the issue of women preaching in our churches on the Lord's Day. That's right. You're should they or should they not? Dwight reached out to you about this. He, he said did. he wanted to debate you. It was, was actually great. as a result of the sword and the trial. You know, we're just doing our show, uh-huh. and uh, Beth Moore talked about preaching on Mother's Day, and we commented on that. Some other the women who talked about it and uh, Dwight McKissick had supported her. And so we quoted Dwight. I quoted Dwight and he told me later, I quoted him accurately. He was grateful for that. That's good. And uh, he put up on Twitter, Hey, since uh, you call me out, so I'm sure you'd be willing to pay for half the cost of a room to have a debate on this question He's in Birmingham. And you said, all right, let's do so, it. Yeah, we already had this thing planned with founders, so we were able yeah. to rearrange some things and do that. And you guys have at least engaged each other a little bit in the past. You oh, invited yeah. him to a founders deal in the past. That's right. He's been to once. a founders breakfast. I mean, and, you know, Dwight's a friend. I mean, he called me a frenemy, which is one of, the, it's one of the nicest things I've been called the last two weeks, actually. So I'll take it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, no, Dwight, we're friends. Uh, we disagree on on some things, undoubtedly. But he's a brother. Um, my, my engagements with him are. Uh, offline have always been really good and you know online we've crossed swords a few times but uh i love him i think it's going to be a wonderful time very good well if you can get out we'd love to see you there at that debate on monday before the convention and if you can't we're going to find ways to make sure that that content's made available to you online so hey let's have a real honest conversation no yeah no some have an honest conversation no kind of conversations you and i have when the cameras aren't rolling see you think they're honest but i've got you fooled (laughs) Yeah, so let's do that. Let's I'm, I'm about, I don't it. think we've had a dishonest conversation on this show. I want to go into deeper levels Uh-oh, of honesty. Here we go. I want to go down there where the where the honest. Where's the edit button? That's what yeah. I want to know. <laughs> let's talk about the SBC. SBC 2019. It's here. This show's it dropping. Is here. Everybody's going to be thinking about the SBC. And just just kind of big picture, where are we at? Here, here's some things that I noticed. So Al Mohler just came out with this recent article. He talked about a decade of decline. Been a right. whole decade of our numbers dropping. He pointed out the secularization of America. That seems right. to be undeniable with what's going on and seems to be that uh, more and more. He, the, the, the stats he shared from the... Um, Oh, who was the report? I don't remember what which report he cited, but it was fascinating. Like seventy percent church attendance in America, and it's down to like I don't know forty, yeah, fifty. Yeah, which dropped in the last ten years only significantly. Last, I think it was the last twenty. I think it was from the turn of the turn of the century, whatever. And so, 
that this is going on. And it seems like SBC is trying to figure out how do we function in the midst of this? So he talked about evangelistic strategy a bit. You got the whole sexual abuse thing that's come out um, in that Houston Chronicle deal with right. all that's going on there. Um, you got a whole bunch of people. We boast about like 16 million people or something like that. Something ridiculous. Not anymore. Now we can only boast about 15, 15 million. Right. We're like, oh, it's we're really going down. There's right. 15 million. But the problem is you can't find you know, half, of, half them. of them. So right. that's a whole deal that's going on. We got the whole issue of women preaching in churches that now seems to be on the rise. Some people say, oh, that's not going to be an issue. Other people think, well, it's going to be an issue. There's, it seems to be a generational right. divide there. So many people are asking, is is it worth fighting for the SBC? Is it is it a joke? You just say, hey, I'm a Reformed Baptist Christian who's serious about the word, and it seems like there's about a lot of mudslinging and yeah. positioning and moral posturing kind of going on here. Should I just get out of here and get serious um, and partner with those who are serious confessional, or should I keep fighting uh, for the Southern Baptist Convention in 2019? Yeah, well, I understand the question, and I have said for 36 years now, um, there are good reasons to stay in the SBC because we have been getting healthier and healthier for the majority of that time. And, and yet I've also always said, look, this is a conscience issue too, and I don't think anybody can be lord of another man's conscience or a church's conscience. So some churches just aren't going to want to cooperate in the way that Southern Baptists cooperate. And I get that. And that is not a problem. Mm -hmm. We have always been willing to do that. Um, the, the things that concern me right now, is the trajectory is unclear. Mm -hmm. You know, the trajectory has been clear for all those decades in the past that I've been involved in this because we've been moving toward health, even when we've had hiccups and going backwards on some things. But what we've also discovered recently is that some of the, the health that we had was in the midst of or covering up some really bad stuff. I mean, the, the sexual abuse stuff that uh, there's undoubtedly there's been some horrible cover ups with that or mishandling, fumbling of that. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to look back on it, given the sensitivities and insights that we have now from all different sources and be even harsher than we should be with the folks in the moment as they're going through it. But if you allow for that, even there's still some things that took place and some uh, uh, ways that that sexual predators were just not handled rightly. They should have been handed over to the police. Mm -hmm. You should call the police. If there's a crime, call the police. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't done uh, multiple times. And now we're seeing it even in the uh, International Mission Board with this latest Houston Chronicle article. So, yeah, our trajectory was good, but there was always this underbelly of things that were not good. And, of course, that's true in every Christian life. That's true in every church. It's true in every season of the world. The devil always keeps pace. So we mm -hmm. shouldn't be shocked by that. But we need an honest reckoning of that. But we need an honest reckoning of that that puts it in the right perspective. Yeah, it seems like if it's, you say a trajectory, but I'm assuming you mean like from like late 80s, early 90s when the conservative resurgence happened. Right, because right. back then you had Molly Marshall as the head of the systematic theology department at Southern Seminary before Al Mohler went in there and fired her or forced her resignation. Right. And you had her talking about the misogynistic forces at, at play right. at that time, which is very similar to what seems to be going on right now. Um, you had people advocating for women in ministry, women pastoring churches, and you had a big fiasco and fight back then. So I, I'm I'm trying to get my bearings. It's fascinating to me. Al Mohler recently tweeted this um, on May 31st. He said, we have reached a critical moment in the Southern Baptist Convention when there are now open calls to retreat from our biblical convictions on complementarianism yeah. and embrace the very error that the SBC repudiated over 30 years ago. Honestly, I never thought I would see this day. Yeah. Um, that sounds like some ominous language. Well, it, it's serious because we got some real serious issues. And one of the things that's very obvious to me is that this uh, Reformation, particularly the Reformation of the Doctrines of Grace that we've seen, has not been very deep. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people have just jumped on the Calvinist bandwagon because it's been chic. You know, mm -hmm. hey, this is cool. It's what the cool kids are doing now. And there hasn't been a, a rigorous confessionalism. There hadn't been a rigorous biblical engagement with mm -hmm. the theology mm -hmm. so that some of these folks that are advocating inerrancy and fallibility and all the, the right good, right and good things are doing so without a rigorous uh, grasp of what the scripture has to teach about its inerrancy and fallibility, authority and sufficiency. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm an inerrantist, but hey, uh, I think that we need to make room for gay Christians 
in the way we talk about the evangelical world or mm-hmm. I'm an inerrantist, but why can't we have women pastors and that type of thing? So that's confounding and it's sad, but it does need to be put in perspective as well. We, we no longer have theology professors beginning their lectures in our seminaries or, or at Southern Seminary on the scripture by walking into the classroom and throwing a Bible in the garbage can. You know, that's, that happened. We no longer have the ERLC, our Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, advocating for Roe v. Wade or abortion on demand. I mean, so praise God mm-hmm. for those things that are no longer a part of us. But just because that's true doesn't mean that everything's healthy over here. Mm-hmm. And we've got some serious issues. We're going to have to face up to them. And I think the biggest one uh, underlying it all is the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. You mm-hmm. know, everybody says, yeah, we believe that. But if you believe that, then it will dictate how you live. Mm-hmm. It will dictate the way you think. And I think what we're getting is a lot of superficial commitment to that without a rigorous comprehension of what it means mm-hmm. to truly live under the authority of Scripture. Because if, if we do that today, you know what's going to happen? We're going to be going against the winds of culture. And what yeah, I find is a to bunch of folks. really going on, man. A bunch of folks that can't stand that, and they, they don't want to be thought ill of by our culture. And yeah. as a result, they're being moved down the wrong path. Yeah, that, it seems to be our Achilles heel. It, it, and even in broader evangelicalism, the, the cardinal sin of wanting to be liked by yep. the world. And then, and then having that imported into your very view of, of, of Christianity. That's right. That it's a law that you be liked by the world. Yeah. Now, you know, the Christian man should be well thought of by outsiders. That's a standard in, in, in First Timothy 3, the qualifications mm-hmm. for an elder, right? And then yet you also have Christ saying, beware when people speak well of you. Yeah, that's right? right. And rejoice when they persecute you. And I do, I think the, I think kind of at, at the heart of what's going on right now is the SBC figuring out, oh, we used to be able to go knock on doors. I mean, I grew up SBC. Mm-hmm. I know how our evangelistic strategy was. We used to be able to do these revivals and people respected Billy Graham and they'd show right. up. Right. And now they're saying, shut up. Right. <laughs> they're saying, shut up. Yeah. You know, and, and the Christian is at the end of the day going, man, what do I do? Do I do I kind of and, and there's a bunch of people that are not going to want to just toss out of Scripture the texts that the world doesn't like. So it's not going to be that clean. It's not right. going to be mean, Andy Stanley is making it clean by trying to unhitch yeah. the Old Testament. He's yep. a guy that's making it clean. But there's going to be a host of people that don't make it clean. It's not going to be this black and white thing. It's going to be minimizing those texts. Yeah, and, it's going to be and, you know pushing to the side. We'll address those things when they come up in our in our expository preaching through Scripture. But you know you're not going to hit these issues um, that are being contended for right now in the culture. And another way that that's working out is people saying, well, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. You know, Jesus didn't say Mm -hmm. anything about women not being able to to preach or to exercise authority over men. And it's pitting Jesus against the rest of scripture as if Jesus isn't speaking through Paul Mm -hmm. and Peter and John. So we've just got this mass confusion and, I do think that, that many of the folks that are, that are falling into this uh, weak approach to advocating Scripture's authority are misunderstanding what it means to love. You know, they think that, that to, yeah. to love your neighbor as yourself is to be nice to your neighbor so that your neighbor says, oh, you know, thank you for being so nice. And neighbor love is not neighbor nice. Yeah. And we need to come back to a real understanding of what does love mean? Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yeah, let's have an honest um, compare and contrast. SBC evangelistic strategy, Book of Acts evangelistic mm. strategy. Mm. Yeah, like, let's just really face up to that. Uh, let's talk about baptisms. And you know, there's going to be people that the SBC 2019. We don't care about evangelism. Yeah, this is a sign because look at the baptisms that are going down. Right. Yeah. Let's just take an honest assessment of the way that they did evangelism and the way we do evangelism. Yeah. You know, their evangelism was three yards in a cloud of dust. Their evangelism was, I'm going to go into this city. I'm going <laughs> to proclaim, repent of your idolatry and trust in the King, trust in Christ Jesus, repent of your sins, turn away from come. There's going to be some that believe there's going to be a whole bunch that want to kill you. And you might get stoned. And you might get stoned. Yeah. And, and, and again, we have lived in a Judeo-Christian society for many years, the, evidenced by that fascinating stat, like 70%. And in the last 20 years, it's dropped the, you know, I yeah. don't know, 40, 50, whatever yeah. it was. And, and that's been like in my, my time in ministry, like right when I'm entering in. And I, I think there's an old generation that still 
Right. Like kind of needs to grasp just how um, God less we are in our thinking as a nation. Like that's right. really, it's just going fast. And so that's going to require you doing things differently. It's going to require you teaching, preaching, thinking, living, um, contrary to the way the world's. I'm yeah. Thinking. And I think you're right about the older generation. You know, we want to hang on and say, man, where's Andy Griffith and Mayberry uh, type of mentality. But the younger generation, I think as well, uh, is being played on many fronts because I think if we can just engage the city, mm-hmm. you know, if we can just show that we love art, we can just show that all the, this can be redeemed. You know, let's redeem these things. And they, they, they begin to wash out what redemption really means. Mm-hmm. You know, rede- redemption's for people. The whole world's going to be mm-hmm. recovered by Christ, no doubt about that. But whenever we start looking at saying, oh, I'm going to redeem this area of the city or I'm going to uh, see the uh, good things come right here by my efforts. Yep. We forget that what Christ died for is the salvation of individual people. Yeah, and, and understanding our context is going to be key here. It, how, how would you live? You know, we get this on the mission field still, I think. How would you live if you if you lived in Saudi Arabia? Exactly. How would you live if you lived in a predominantly Hindu nation? Yeah. Right? Um, how would you live if you lived in a predominantly Buddhist society? Well, you would know there's no peace between Christ and Buddha. That's right. There's no peace between uh, Christ and Ganesh. There's no peace between Christ and and, uh, Allah. So you're not going to be mean. That's not By by no means is that the call. But you're going to be thinking, oh, this is distinct. There will be a conversion from this. Well, when you're in America, you're still thinking of people as kind of indifferent. They're in, they're, Mm. they're, they're, they're neutral. They haven't, they're just kind of folks that nuns. they're not neutral. They're yeah. not, they're devoted to a humanistic uh, belief system. They've been taught it for years upon years in the educational system. And they're thinking they're, they're doing what Paul said in Romans one. And the church really needs to identify that SBC needs to identify that. Right. Okay. We're calling people to repent of their idolatry and to come to Christ. Yeah. I think it's going to be let, huge. Let me, let me clarify something too, you know, about uh, redeeming the city or redeeming this part of the city. If, if we were in Saudi Arabia, we wouldn't be thinking about, man, how do we make Saudi Arabia more, more Christian? How do we make uh, the, this city uh, more Christianized? No, we, we want to see individual Muslims come to Christ, knowing that as individual Muslims come to Christ, more and more of them, they're going to think like Christians as we disciple them in the Word of God, and they are going to change Saudi Arabia. Yes. That's how it has happened. Yeah, Saudi Arabia will be changed Absolutely. through but, individuals repenting but and believing. What I see going on today is that we get the cart before the horse on this, mm-hmm. and we think that we can just Christianize things, and that that's going to make people like us, and that's going to make people want to follow Christ. That doesn't work. It's only the gospel that's the power of God to salvation mm-hmm. for everyone who believes. Mm-hmm. And if we lose sight of that, even to a small degree, then we're going to be a million miles off course. Amen. Hey, we're not done with this. We're going to come back. We're going to take a break. And then when we come back, I want to talk more about the SBC, particularly uh, solutions to the SBC. <clears throat> we kind of set it up here. This is where we're at. What things really need to happen? If you're gonna if you're gonna leave, leave. If you're gonna stay and you're a confessional Baptist Christian, it's time to fight. It's time to speak the truth and what needs to be done if we're gonna see reformation within Southern Baptist churches. So we'll be right back to talk more about that. Founders Ministries has been able to do what we've been doing for 35 years because people have joined with us and become part of our family. Today, I'm inviting you to become a part of the Founders Fam as well. Become a Founders Alliance member. You can do this at different levels as you contribute to the work that Founders is engaged in. By going to founders.org, you can see that you can give at the trowel level, you can give at the shield level, or you can give at the sword level. And if you give at any level, we're going to send you a Founders package of materials materials. We have other exclusive material that we would make available to you as well as you contribute to help us build this ministry for the glory of God. Well, welcome back to The Sword and the Trowel. We are talking about the SBC because the SBC 2019 is coming up just next week. And we've talked a little bit about the problems that we're facing in the SBC. Now we want to talk about some solutions that uh, as far as we're concerned, these, these are things that could really help us. If it's time to stand up and fight, here's, here's some things to do. And I would get us started by saying we should, we should repent of lying. Well, that's always a great place to start is repentance. Yeah. If we repent of lying that we might expect some more blessing from God, particularly lying about our membership. 
It's just, it's insane. It really is. It's just really, really bad. And I've grown up SBC my whole life. I'm so thankful for people that want to have big churches and we want to celebrate how many people are in there. But we know that we don't have 16 million or 15 million people. We absolutely know it. Everyone knows it. Everyone will know it in the convention hall. Everyone will know when we lament the decline of 100,000 people or whatever, that it's actually just, it's all fake. It's this created mm-hmm. kind of thing. And I think it's connected to a lot of the problems that we have going on. I, I go, you go ahead. I'll, I'm, yeah. I'm going to save mine. <laughs> I just was reminded years ago, I was speaking on regenerate church membership to a pastor's conference in Alabama. And after the session, I was meeting with a couple of pastors that had asked to meet with privately and a, another pastor I did not know kind of broke into our private meeting weeping. And I said, brother, what's wrong? He said, I got the worst church here in, he named the county. And uh, I said, well, what do you mean? He says, we got uh, 2,000 people on our church roll. He said, we have about four, uh, 250 that come. And he said, and I know it's wrong. And I said, well, well, praise God, you know it's wrong. And then start dealing with it. And I said, why, why won't you do it? He said, well, I just can't bring myself to do it. I said, why not? He said, I cannot bear the thought of being the pastor of a small church. <laughs> and I thought, I mean, I, I was grieved for the brother. Uh-huh. I'm thinking, what have we done to him? To yeah. give him that sense of yeah. if it looks good on paper, you know. Yeah, yeah th- this this is why it's so it's such a beautiful and and simple and hard thing to do. Yeah. It's like make your bed. <laughs> That's right. right. That's you want right. to change the world? Make, make your, bed. your bed. Pastors don't really want to do this. Uh, look at your membership. Take that big old fat crazy role that you've got that you might have inherited when you got to the church, and go to your elders, or if you're still got the deacons thing and you're working on that long term plan to turn them into elders, uh, go there and and say if these people aren't coming, we we can't pretend like they are, yeah. and so it's time to clean up this membership role and actually shepherd the flock of God that yeah. is among you. That Peter says you're going to give an account for souls. Which souls? Know them, number them, care for them identify them, make sure when people come in, you the number increases and you know what kind of shepherd doesn't know how many sheep he really has, how many sheep he's really caring for. This is very practical and it's going to be hard and you're going to have to teach your church about it because Baptist churches, the SBC churches are not used to this. So you're going to have to start teaching and get down to the nitty gritty and make this change. You know, this is connected to a number of the problems that we're facing, particularly the sexual abuse thing. Think about mm-hmm. this. What's really happening in, in our SBC churches, what's happening is many people are wanting big, fat church rosters, and so they're doing what's necessary to get those big, fat church rosters. They're not, and those people, not everybody, but the, those people that are doing that are not shepherding the flock. They're not paying attention to the flock, mm-hmm. like praying for them, checking in on them, finding ways to make sure, even if it's a big flock, that they're cared for. They're not really being cared for. They're not being watched over. Overseers are not overseeing. And well, what happens? Bad stuff happens when that goes. I'm not saying that if you do this, that you're not going to have anybody that's sexually abused in your church. Of course, we can't protect against that. Of course not. But there really is a problem in the fact that what we're trying to do is have numbers skyrocket. Well, what do you do then? Well, let's throw a program and let's have some people enlisted here and let's not worry about them being background checked because we need to get this event going. We need to have volunteers. Mm -hmm. We need to have all this stuff because this is what we're supposed to do rather than diligently, faithfully shepherding the flock. Yeah, there's no doubt uh, that's true. I I think some of it too, it's not not just people that want big churches or whatever. I think that, that there's a misunderstanding of evangelism, what evangelism is and what true Christianity looks like when a person does come to Christ. And so all that's in the mix as well. I wrote an article about this uh, a couple of months ago on the Founders website about our our greatest problem, as difficult and horrific as the sexual abuse stuff is, it's not our greatest problem. That is more of a symptom of a greater problem that you've just articulated. And if we're going to be serious about what Christ tells us the church is to be, a local church is to be, then we're going to have to do some deep repenting. We're going to have to do some deep changing Mm -hmm. and John Dagg, the first writing theologian among Baptists in the South in the 19th century, said this, that when discipline leaves a church, Christ goes with it. Mm -hmm. We just think about that for a minute. If that's true, if a church is not uh, conscientiously practicing and obeying Matthew 18, 15 through 18, 1 Corinthians 5, Mm -hmm. about disciplining those wayward members that refuse to repent, if Christ leaves a church that's not practicing that, then what does that mean? Well, it means that they may have a reputation that they're alive, but in, inside they're really dead. Mm-hmm. It may be that Jesus is looking at them and evaluating them differently than the world is evaluating them. So, yeah, we, I think fundamentally what we as Southern Baptists need to do is come to terms with the fact that we're in a mess mm-hmm. 
And uh, the God's judgment is upon us in many ways. And we want his blessing. Well, if we want his blessing, we need to honor his way and his word. Mm -hmm. And we need to confess we have not done this. And it needs to be even our, our, uh, our, our leaders in the executive uh, branches of the SBC, the entities and agency heads. You know, in 2008, uh, there was a resolution passed on regenerate church membership by the Southern Baptist Convention. And in that, it said that we urge churches of the Southern Baptist Convention to repent of the failure among us to live up to our professed commitment to regenerate church membership and any failure to obey Jesus Christ in the practice of lovingly correcting wayward church members. And then it says, we humbly encourage denominational servants to support and encourage churches that seek to recover and implement our Savior's teaching on church discipline, even if such efforts result in the reduction of the number of members that are reported in those churches. Mm. Well, that's right. It's Mm -hmm. still a very important point for us to take to heart. Mm -hmm. So um, (laughs) tighten up the membership. That's one. You got other ideas on what needs to be done if we're really going to see the reformation of Southern Baptist churches. Yeah, I think I think we need to look at our confession of faith. Uh, I think we need to look at the Baptist faith gonna and be, message. This is going to this is big. I know, but people pe- aren't going to like it. People are taking it and turning it into a wax nose to fit any face that they find uh, uh, appropriate today. It's exactly right, and I know there's going to be all kinds of debates about. No, it's not the time to change the confession. The confession should only be changed every few decades or whatever. And the Baptist faith and message two thousand is really a good deal and you know hey praise god for the baptist faith and message 2000 Absolutely. right yeah. um, but we are very clearly dealing with a time uh, where the people are saying well yeah let's we are all about the authority of scripture but eh. yeah we're all about the confession but uh. well let me let me just tell you how one pastor has justified his advocacy for women pastors in the SBC without violating the Baptist faith and message 2000. He mm-hmm. says what the confession says is that the office of pastor is restricted only to men. He said, well, there's no such thing as an office of pastor in the new Testament. So there's only the role of pastor right. pastoring churches. And so right. he just uses that word game to justify, Oh, I'm completely within the Baptist faith and message. And I think we ought to have women pastors. Right. When, when, the, when, the, when the culture's going uh, to this, in, increasingly this postmodern idea, yeah. you know, where you're not going to really, you're not going to take words seriously. Right. Well, let us respond by saying we're people of the word, and therefore yeah. we are not afraid to strengthen our confession and hold these things. And for those who say, oh, no, that's not fair, and you're going to eliminate certain people from the, oh, look, we're not trying to <laughs> do any of that kind of thing, but let's be serious about our roots. That's right. Let's be serious right. about where we were when we started back in 1845. Yeah. Where was that? That was the baptized Westminster Confession. Yeah. That's what it was. The and 1689 Savoy. Confession. And Savoy. And Savoy. And so we were robustly doctrinal. And everyone knows that. And I've had people tell me, you know, well, it wasn't just churches. It was churches and associations. That's the Timothy George. Well, great. Okay, it was churches and associations. I don't mind saying that. Absolutely. We all know we were healthier, more robust, theologically committed, more serious about our membership, and more serious about the gospel of Jesus Christ then than we are now. And if we're unable or unwilling to have a conversation about strengthening our confession, so it's more reflective of scripture, yeah. the standard that we're all committed to, then we've got, we really, I, I think I would call all of the young guys not to be over the top about this, right. but to be patient and insistent. Are we trying to recover the gospel and reform the Southern Baptist churches or not? I and mean, if we're not, then let's just, let's just do the game. Let's show up at the convention and have everybody talk about having 15 million people. If we're serious about reforming the Southern Baptist Convention, the world is very serious about snuffing out the gospel of Jesus Christ right. right now in our land. And it's time for us to stand up and say, look, we're really, we're serious about this. We're committed you know, to the book. You know, Jared, we did this, our elders did this four, five, six years ago when we uh, led the church to revise our own constitution and bylaws. You remember we put that language that sounded so pedantic and people said, why are you putting in there yeah. that marriage is between one biological male and one biological female. You know, yeah. just why do we have to say that? Well, we had to say it because little did we know, but a couple of years later, a burger fell happened. Right. And so we cannot take for granted that the language that was used before that everybody understood then 
is sufficient for what we want to communicate now that we believe. That's right. And there are, there are a lot of theological issues that if you're, if you have your eyes open, you know, people might not be advocating positions. Clearly some of them are advocating some of the highest levels in the SBC are advocating right. positions that are very clearly denying things like God's hierarchical design of the world. Yeah. Talking about tearing down of all hierarchy. That's not in step with what scripture says we're right. to do to civil authorities. That's or, right. No, what we're supposed to do with headship in the home, what we're supposed to do in submission to church. Or saying that the Bible has certain commands in it that it doesn't have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's this, there's going to be this egalitarian uh, effort in the world around us, and there is such an effort. Yep. If there's going to be confusions over justice, and there are confusions over justice, if there's going to be confusions over um, what's called uh, ungracious and what's called, <laughs> what's called, you know, what, what love is, what you're being unloving. <laughs> yeah. Let's clarify yeah. scripturally what is grace, what is love, what it means to um, contend for the truth, and yeah. And what it means to live in God's hierarchical world so that when we say, hey, you need to submit or you need to do these kind of things that people aren't going, oh, well, this is some grave injustice. Right. Um, it's time for us to do these things. Yeah. SBC 2019. Well, we need to be thinking about them. We need to be willing to take some hard stands on the scripture and uh, not move one inch. Yeah. Hey. Thanks for listening to The Sword and the Trowel, and we would love to see you at the Southern Baptist Convention in Birmingham next week. We would love for you to come to our event, The Mature Manhood in an Immature Age, and Tom's Debate with Dwight McKissick. Sign up. We're have a really good time. Thanks again for listening.